Well, hello and welcome to Thrive Church. We are so excited to have you here with us today as we continue our series, Your Turn. And, uh, you know, w- one of the songs we sang, what, you know, some of the lyrics in it said, said, I am chosen and I am who you say I am. I am chosen. Did you know that God has chosen you? That God has chosen you. God has chosen you, and and he said, I am who you say I am. There's a lot of things that this world says about us that you're not good enough, that you don't measure up, but how many of us know that that's not what matters? What matters is what our God says about us, who he says that we are. And in this series, Your Turn, we're talking about the gifts that God has given us. God has given each of you certain gifts, certain abilities to do certain things well, and, and, and those are the things that define us, not the labels that other people put on us, not even the labels that we put on ourselves, but these gifts that God has given us, each of you that is following Jesus Christ has been given a gift by God, and you are chosen. You are chosen to do his good work. But as we've been talking about through this series, there's some guidelines, right? There's some guidelines on how to use these gifts so that they can be most effective and so that we can truly glorify God who is the giver of these gifts. In your notes, our gifts are to be used in love to serve people and point them to Jesus. Why don't we read that aloud together, okay? Here we go. Our gifts are to be used in love to serve people and point them to Jesus. This is so critical because so many times in life, People try to use their gifts in ways that are contrary to this. They try to use the gifts to serve themselves. They try to use the gifts to please themselves. They try to use the gifts to manipulate other people even at times. But these gifts were given to me and to you by God to be used in love. It says this all throughout 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter says that that if you have the gift of prophecy, but you don't use it in love, well, it's worthless. If you have the gift of, of healing or miracles, if you have any of these gifts, but if you don't use them in love, they are worthless. And they're to be used to serve the people around us, to serve others here in the church, and to serve others that are outside the walls of the church. Ultimately, not to point people to me, but to point people to Jesus Christ. That's who all of these gifts should be pointing to. Now it says in Ephesians 4.11, and this is the list that we've been going off of throughout this series, this list of gifts that Christ gave the church. It says, now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. So, So we've already been going through some of these over the last several weeks. The apostles, These are ones who dream and strategize for the future. They're ones that have big ideas for how to reach more people with the kingdom of God. They they oversee ministries and churches and organizations. They're strategically minded. They're leadership minded. Then we have the prophets, and these are the ones who, who listen to God. They hear God's voice, and they're willing to take action on that. Whatever that action may be, that action may be speaking words to someone else, words of encouragement, words pointing people to Jesus, maybe even words of warning. Maybe, maybe this gift of prophecy comes out through your life and, and, the, and the ability to discern right from wrong, to discern what's from God and what's not from God. It can come out in in gifts of tongues. It can come out in a variety of different ways, but it's always listening to God's voice and being willing to obey what his voice says. The evangelists, what we talked about last week, these are, are people who have the ability to draw people closer to Jesus Christ through invitation, through sharing their personal stories perhaps, through a variety of different things. These are evangelists. Now, all of us have been called to share our faith with others, but some people have the ability to just really draw people at at, at even a larger capacity. In fact, I've had uh, people, I've had conversations within this church who who says, you know, I've I've invited everybody I possibly can and nobody ever comes to church. And it's like, well, hey, at least you're out there 
giving it your best, right? And then some people, they, they come, and they're bringing like 15, 20 people to church, and, and it's like, well, they're like, I don't know, I just invite them. They just have this, this gifting from God to be even more effective in these areas. The pastors, these are ones who, who love to go along beside somebody and love them and care for them in times of difficulty. And then the teachers, those who have the ability to read and study God's word and, and bring personal application into the lives of other people, whether that's one person, a small group of people, a large group of people. In verse 12, it says that their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. So our responsibility in using these gifts is A, to fan the gift into flame, to cultivate the gift, to develop the gift so that we can be more effective using the gift, but then also it says that it's our job to equip others, to begin to bring those gifts out in other people as well, to call those gifts out. And I've already heard some stories of, of people going up and, and encouraging somebody, saying, you know, I, I feel like you have this, this gift in your life, and, and, and I believe that that's what God has called us to do because when we as a church are not functioning in all five areas, I believe that we, our effectiveness is lowered than when we are engaged with all five of these areas. And it's our job and responsibility to begin to uncover what our gifts are. But sometimes the best way to do that is by talking to other people. Other people can point out things in your own life that maybe you're unaware of on your own. So their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work, build up the church, the body of Christ. So I believe that each one of you here that's following Jesus Christ, that you have one of these gifts. And, and, and many of you actually have more than one gift. Maybe you have, maybe you have two gifts that, you're, you're, uh, that are primary. And, and some of these other gifts, even if you're weak in them, they're areas that we can learn to develop, to live the Christ-like life. So the one we're talking about today is the pastors. Now, now, this is probably the most common term out of all of them, the pastors. We use this term very loosely. We, we, talk, we, we call people pastors. I mean, that, that's part of my title is that I'm the lead pastor here at Thrive Church. But it's also probably one of the most misunderstood because the label gets thrown around so casually. Everything seems to get lumped under pastor, whether someone is a, an apostle or an evangelist or a prophet or a teacher or a pastor, we all just kind of lump them all together under this one word of pastor. Oftentimes, it implies someone who is a full-time clergy, a full-time person that, that is working for the church. We often just throw this label on them as pastor. But it's interesting that as I was studying this, the word pastor is only used one time in the entire Bible. It's only used one time in the New Testament, and we just read that one time where it says, and he gave the pastors and teachers. It's the only time that it's used. But it's interesting that if you look at the Greek word that this was translated from, this word was actually used 18 times, but it was translated differently every single time except this one time. It was always translated as the word shepherd, shepherd. That's the word that, that's translated all throughout the New Testament is this word shepherd, Jesus saying, I'm the good shepherd. And we're talking about shepherd and this word continually comes through this. You know, a, a, the idea of pastor has more to do with being a shepherd. It has more to do with cultivating something. In fact, the word like pastoral, you know, we think of pastoral as being, being kind of like, like a, a farmland, the, the pastoral, you know, is this, this farmland is, is this cultivating of things. Speaking of shepherding and livestock and such, that, uh, I heard a story that there was a pastor and, and, uh, and he had a horse and he trained this horse, except he wanted his horse to be a, a religious horse, right? And so, so instead of some of the, uh, instead of some of the, the, the normal terms like, like giddy up and, and woe, he decided that he would change them to be a little more spiritual. So, so there was a guy that came to purchase this horse, and, and the pastor said, before you ride my horse, let me tell you uh, some of the instructions on how to, how to control this horse. Instead of saying, giddy up, you have to say, hallelujah, and the horse will, will take off. And, and instead of saying, whoa, you say the word, amen. 
And the guy's like, oh, that, that's interesting. So that's, that's the only thing different. You just say amen, and the horse will stop, and hallelujah, and the horse just takes off like lightning. So the guy gets up on the horse, and he says, hallelujah, and the horse just takes off. And, and this is a fast horse, and, and, and they're just barreling down. And the guy, he's loving this horse, and he says, amen, and the horse stops. Like, just like the, the pastor said, and he says, hallelujah, takes off again, this fast horse. And then, as he's riding for a few moments, his mind blanks out, and he forgets what the word is to stop the horse. And he starts going through his mind, was it Bible? Was it Jesus? Uh, what was it? Was it glory? What was it, heaven? Oh, and, and then he sees a cliff right in front of him, and the horse is going full speed towards this cliff, and the guy just begins to panic. So he calls out the guy and says, dear Lord, please save me. Let me not go over this cliff in Jesus' name, amen. And just a foot from the edge of the cliff, that horse stopped. And the man looks up to heaven and says, hallelujah. <laughs> uh, I don't think that was a true story. Um, but but the, this, this idea of pastor really has more to do with, with agriculture, with shepherding. Literally, you can put this in your notes, a pastor is a shepherd of people. A pastor is a shepherd of people, someone who cares for other people. Jesus called himself the good shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. And in all aspects of these five areas, we see reflected in Jesus Christ. Being the perfect person, the Messiah, the Son of God, all of these aspects he reflected perfectly. But one of the aspects was that he was the good shepherd. And it's our job as, as pastors to shepherd other people. Now, maybe you have that, that natural ability to shepherd and care for people, and if so, maybe this is a gift that God is developing in your life. What a shepherd does is, a shepherd is someone who leads other people to pasture. Remember in Psalms 23, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me in these right places. So a shepherd leads to pasture. Pasture kind of sounds like pastor. Again, a lot of these words share the same root. It means that you're willing to feed and tend to and care for and guard and protect the flocks. My parents have a dog, and, and his name is Tracker, and he's a, a border collie. He's a, a sheep herder. And it's funny because when, whenever uh, we would go to their house and, and the kids will be swimming in the pool. Tracker just like runs around the pool as fast as he can. From youngest to oldest, just checking on him, just checking on him, just checking on him, checking. Okay, once he goes through, goes, checks on him again, checks on him. I mean, he would check on him so many times. I know this sounds bad, but but his feet would like, it would he would rub them raw. He would run so much because all he wanted to do was herd these kids and make sure that these kids were, were okay. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says, so guard yourselves and God's people. It says, feed and shepherd God's flock. This is the call of everyone who is a pastor at heart, who has these pastoral gifts in their life, to guard God's people, to feed and shepherd God's flock. His church, who Jesus purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders, guarding the flock. Feeding, shepherding, protecting. In your notes, shepherds protect their sheep. If you remember King David, David was from the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, before Jesus even came onto the scene, there was a, a man named David, the same David that you may have heard of that, that fought against the Goli uh, Goliath, a giant, who also became the ultimate king of Israel at the time. But before any of that happened, David was a shepherd. A shepherd at heart, he cared for the flock. He would fight to the death of lions and bears and, and whatever would come against the sheep, he would go out and he would fight them in order to protect the flock that was given to him. The apostle Peter, one of Jesus' closest followers, Peter was, uh, was one who was following Jesus from the very beginning, but we know that that Peter made a mistake and he denied Jesus. And after Jesus died and he rose back to life again, he was sitting with Peter and he says to Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yeah, of course I love you. He says, well, then feed 
my sheep. It's Peter, do you love me? He's like, yes, I love you. Then care for my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, then feed my sheep. Three times Jesus calls him and says, do you love me? And if you love me, I want you to shepherd the people around you. I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to care for the flock. I want you to be a shepherd and protect them and guide them and walk through life with them. See, that's what a shepherd does. They're willing to take the journey with you. Now, some of these other areas, man, they they like to share God's love. They like to speak on behalf of God, but a pastor is always willing to take the journey with you. They're willing to go beside you to hold your hand when you're crying, to be there celebrating with you, rejoicing in times of joy and triumph. But here he says, Peter, care for my sheep, feed my sheep. And then now, here we see it spin all the way around again, and now Peter is challenging other people with the very same thing in 1 Peter 5, 2. 1 Peter 5, 2, Peter is now saying, care for the flock that God has entrusted you. See, Peter has lived his life He's cared for the flock. He's been a pastor. He's been a shepherd. And now he's challenging those who will follow in his footsteps. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. I wonder if we ever watch over God's flock grudgingly. In fact, I've heard some pastors say things like, like, I love being a pastor. It's just the people that I can't stand. It's like, wait a minute. If you're a pastor and you don't have any people, then you're probably not a very good pastor, are you? Because what a pastor truly is is someone who's caring for the flock, caring for the body of Christ, caring for others. So watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you're eager to serve God. Are we serving simply for what we will get out of it? Or are we serving because we're eager, we're anxious, we're anticipating? We're eager to serve God and and to serve other people that are around us. we're, We're eager to love them. In your notes, a pastor is one who cares for and feeds the sheep. Cares for and feeds the sheep. Now, every single one of these, we've been talking about some of the, the, the strengths, but we've also been talking about the pitfalls, some of the potential weaknesses of the area. So here's some of the, the, the potentials, and the reason why I'm pointing them out is sometimes it actually, seeing the negative helps us to see what gift we really have, because sometimes it's easier to see the negative sides of ourselves than the positive. So here's some of the, the potential pitfalls for someone who has the gift of being a pastor, but maybe they're a little immature in it. Maybe it's not fully developed yet. The first is that, that they're, they're not, um, they, they don't challenge other people to grow in their faith. There's this tendency that they only want to speak out in love, and they don't want to, they don't want to challenge someone to grow. They just want to love them where they are, but they're not so interested in make, helping them to move forward. They, they, they don't necessarily call them out to, to change. They have a hard time bringing up sin or bringing up things in their life. Now, on the flip side, a prophet, someone who's a gift of prophecy, they will call out sin all day long and maybe not even do it very lovingly. Uh, the pastor, on the other hand, they don't want to bring it up. They just want to sit there and love people. They just want to sing kumbaya. You know? They just want to be there in the difficult times. But they sometimes... Don't challenge the growth. Growth. The other thing is that, that they tend to sometimes see too much gray area. Again, contrasting it with, a, with a, uh, someone who has a gift of prophecy, someone who has a gift of prophecy sees things in black and white. Someone who has a gift of being a pastor often sees things in a variety of shades of gray. It's like, well, there's just all these different shades of gray, and, and so I'm just going to love them where they are, and right and wrong is not maybe as clear if it's not developed the way it should be. The other potential uh, pitfall is there's a tendency to sacrifice other relationships in life so that they can serve people who they think are hurting. So that there's this tendency that they can sacrifice their family and their friends and other uh, relationships in their life. They sacrifice those because they feel so drawn to someone who's hurting. And sometimes they can do that at the neglect of their own family. And, and, and that's not a very safe place to be. And, and, and I get it. The reason why is because they love people so much, but it's easy to start focusing on them instead of focusing on those who are closest to you. Another thing that, that can be a potential pitfall is that they can take 
too much responsibility for other people's pain. They, they, they literally want to get into their life and they want to help this person carry it. And then they can take too much responsibility and they can start to blame themselves for bad choices that other people maybe made. Somebody makes a bad choice. Well, if I was there more, if I had helped them more, if I had given them better advice, maybe they wouldn't have done this. And if these are thoughts that you've ever had in your life, then maybe it's because you have the gift of pastoring. You just care for people. You want to take their pain, but we need to draw a line that we're not taking the responsibility for that onto ourselves. Now, on the flip side, here's some positives, okay? Here's the positives. First thing in your notes is that pastors are always willing to give. If you know someone that has a gift of a pastoral heart, they're, they're incredibly generous people. They will literally give you the shirt off their own back. They're always looking to, to give generously, to help the hurting, to comfort somebody. If there is a need and, and you know someone who has this gift, they're the first person that you want to call in a time of difficulty. It says in Proverbs eleven twenty five, 25, the generous will prosper and those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. And this is kind of like the, the motto of someone who has a pastor's heart wanting to be generous, wanting to help to refresh others, always being willing to lend a helping hand. Now, have you ever noticed that there's a big difference between helping someone and actually wanting to help them? You know what I'm saying? Like, like where this becomes most obvious is when somebody has to move, right? And they say, hey, we got to move. Would anybody like to help us move? Now, now, there's a lot of us that will help, right? but not many of us actually want to help. We're like, oh, wow, I can't wait to come over and help you go through all of your belongings that you've accumulated for the last 30 years, and I should probably just throw them in a dumpster, but I would love to help you to move them to your next home. You know, not, not many people, but there are some people like this. I know many people like this, and you call them for help, you have an issue, and they want to be there. They want to help. Pastors are also encouragers, encouragers. Always encouraging people. Always bringing words that, that build up, that lift up. Writing cards of encouragement. That uh, You're just encouraging people. In your notes, encouragers give courage to others. That's what, that's what that word encourage means. It means to give courage. They're willing to, to give courage to other people. They want to build other people up. They're good listeners. Pastors are kind of like that song, Home on the Range, right? Where seldom is heard a discouraging word. They're, they're always looking, to how can I build someone up? How can I build them up? 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you're already doing. Encourage one another. Now, now, this is not just something that the pastors should be doing. People that have the gift of, of, of a pastor, this is something that we should all be striving to do, to be encouragers, building other people up, building up one another, challenging them to grow in their relationship with God. But it says, encourage one another and build one another up. So often in life, what do we do? We like to tear people down. We like to be discouraging. Oh, you can't do that. You're not good enough for that. I'm just going to tear you down. Oh, you want to go and do that? No, no, there's no way. I'm just going to keep you grounded. And we say, we say, oh, I'm just helping keeping them grounded. But that's not really what we're doing at all. We're just discouraging them. We're discouraging says, encourage one another and build each other up. Are our words building each other up? People with the heart of a pastor, they love spending time with people. Love spending time with people. They love being around people. They love comforting them when they're hurting. They love celebrating with them when they're celebrating. They love being there with other people. Through the ups and the downs of life, they just absolutely love people. They're people, people. They just love being around people all the time. Now, now some of these other areas, like, like prophets, people with the gift of prophecy, they tend to be more, more loners a lot of time. Like they, they'll, when they're around people, you're kind of on edge because you're not quite sure what they're going to say because they, when they want to be around people, it's because like they got a message. I got something I want to say. Teachers love being around people when they're teaching them something. Evangelists, well, they love being around 
sinners. They love being around people who are far from God. They absolutely love being around people far from God. But pastors, they just love being with people. Just being with people. No agenda, no, no ulterior motive, just being with them. They, they, they love having one-on-one conversations with other people, hearing the heart, loving them through the difficulties of life. Another thing they're always doing is they always, they always love showing mercy. Always love showing mercy and forgiveness to people. In your notes, God shows mercy to the merciful. So as a result, they often attract more of God's mercy into their own life. Maybe you've already received mercy, and that's why you have this passion and desire to share it with others. This, this mercy that they show brings healing to other people, both emotionally and spiritually. Barnabas, we talked about him a few weeks ago. He had this pastoral gift, a pastoral ability. When the apostle Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas wanted to bring John Mark on a missionary trip, and Paul said, nope, he burned me once. I'm never doing that again. And Barnabas said, okay, I'm gonna show mercy to him. I'm gonna bring him with me. He actually sacrificed some of his relationship with Paul in order to do it but he had that that ability to show mercy, burdened with other people's problems. And 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 when they're able to fan this gift into flame, they do have the ability to tell people the truth, but to do it in a loving way. They, They can tell you what you need to hear, but do it in such a loving way that it inspires you to grow closer to God and not further away. In Colossians, Chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. This is what you live your life by if you have this gift. If you have the heart of a pastor, this is what resonates with you. Clothing yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, is making allowance for each other's faults. How often do we do that? Make allowance for each other's faults? Or do we point their faults out to them? Do we write their faults down in a journal so that we can remember them and bring them up the next time we have an argument with somebody? Are we keeping a record of people's faults? Or are we having the heart of a pastor here which says make allowance? That means I'm planning in advance that people are going to have faults but I'm going to make allowance for it right now. Making allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And above all, clothe yourselves with what? With love. Clothe yourselves with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. Clothe ourselves in love. There's a lot of ways that this pastoral gift maybe uh, may, may come out in your life. Maybe it's through giving and generosity. Maybe it's with just always the desire to help other people, to help around the church, to help anywhere it's needed. I just have the passion and desire to help. Comes in in hospitality where you're always wanting to be around other people, inviting people into your home, helping the, you know, the church to be hospitable, you know, providing refreshment for people, being behind the scenes to make other people's experience enjoyable. Maybe the gift of encouragement, where we we go around encouraging people, inspiring them to live a courageous life. It often comes out in patience. Last thing you notice is that pastors often find that loving people comes naturally. You know, all of these areas, they all need to be based in love. But this one is one that that is defined by love, loving other people. It's so useful. It's useful in our church. You know, this is an area that that, that if you feel like like this is an area that that you have that God is developing in your life, maybe leading a a thrive group or maybe going on visits, love, you know, going to do hospital visits and visiting people who are hurting, maybe greeting people, maybe being willing to pray for people when they're going through hard times. Love to to serve each other, serving them in love because God has called us to pastor each other. I know that, that, you know, my title is lead pastor, but but I'm not the one 
who is called to pastor everyone. We are called to pastor each other, to show love to one another, to bear each other's burdens, to encourage one another, to lift each other up, to build them up. It's our job to build up each other, to encourage. It's our job to pastor together the people that come here. You're called to pastor those around you. See, Jesus, he he came, he was the good shepherd. And he was the one who was always sticking up for the underdog. How about us? Do we stick up for the underdog? Do we stick up for the outcast? Do we stand up for those who are hurting, who are addicted, who are alone, who are deprived, who are less fortunate, who are underprivileged, who, 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 who are going through difficulties in their life? Are we like the good shepherd in that regard? See, the good shepherd, he cares for his flock. He cares for the sheep. Do we care for those who are around us? Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, and you know what I do as a good shepherd? I go after stray sheep. I go after stray sheep. So he gave a story, and he said, imagine that that, that I'm a shepherd, and I got 100 sheep, and they're all safe and sound, but one of them slips away. What does a good shepherd do? You just write it off as a financial loss. Well, that was one one sheep. At least I got 99 more. No, he says that the good shepherd goes off. He leaves the 99 behind, and he goes out to find the one. He goes out, and he fights the lions, and he fights the bears, and, and he does whatever it is that he needs to do to get that sheep. Maybe the sheep is all tangled up in the briars. Maybe the sheep has gotten hurt. Maybe the sheep is lost. But that shepherd, the good shepherd, will not give up. Will not give up seeking until he finds that sheep and brings it back. And as he brings back the sheep, who other people may have been willing to write off, he brings him back and brings him back with rejoicing, saying, let's rejoice together that the sheep who is lost is now found. And that's our job, to seek and save those who are lost. That's what Jesus came, and us as the church, as the body of Christ, that needs to be our passion and mission as well, to go out, to leave the 99, to go and chase the one, to chase the one who's far Who's, who's, who's left God, who's maybe tangled up in some things. Maybe they're broken. Maybe they're hurt. Maybe they did some things that they regret, but that we go out there, that we love them as the good shepherd and bring them back into the house of the Lord with rejoicing because he is the good shepherd and we are called to shepherd as he did. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness and we thank you that you didn't leave us out there all on our own, but that you came for us and that you loved us and that you brought us back in, that you carried us back with great rejoicing, that we were returned to your flock. And if you're here and you don't know the good shepherd, Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ. Maybe you don't have a personal relationship with him. And today's the day. Scripture says anyone who calls on his name will be saved. So won't you call out to him now? Won't you call out to our good shepherd, our pastor, our shepherd, Jesus Christ? Won't you call out to him now? It says that if you believe in him and you call out on his name, that you will be saved. So can't we call out and say, Jesus, you're my Lord. You are my shepherd, and I shall not want. Now, maybe you're here, and through this, you start to see yourself a little bit. And the interactions that you have, maybe the, the willingness to show love, the willingness to go through the journey of life with other people. So God, may you fan this gift into flame in the lives of people that are in here even now so that we can love each other better, so that we can pastor each other better, so that we can shepherd those that you have brought into our care and that we won't leave one, but that we will be willing to go out and find the one who's lost and bring them in. So please, help us to develop these gifts because there's so much at stake. 
There's so many lives of men and women and boys and girls that are at stake. So let us be like the good shepherd. Let us be shepherds and go out and find people and love them and take them through the journey of life. Not that we're afraid to to point them in the right direction and to call out sin when we need to, but that most importantly, that we're willing to love them through the difficulties of life, through the ups and the downs, the hills, the valleys, all these things. Let us show them your love. In Jesus' name, amen.